Welcome to mini lecture 2.5. This is our last lecture on an introduction to research methods in psychology. And in this segment, we're going to focus exclusively on experiments and experimental methods. Okay, we've gone through descriptive methods, we've gone through correlational studies, and now we get to the most powerful experimental technique that research psychologists can use, and that's the experimental method. Now, why are experiments so great? Well, because a researcher has control. The thing that the researcher wants to manipulate or vary, the researcher has control over that. So she can vary that, she can manipulate that variable and keep everything else the same. She can also control for variations across subjects by randomly sampling participants. Um, so there's a, there's a control, there's a finesse there. With, in experiments, you really feel like um, you have control over the situation if you're a scientist. Okay, so experimental research can explore cause and effect, which the previous methods can't do, so it can explore cause and effect. It can be used to evaluate new therapies. So, uh, for example, you know, new vaccines are coming out for the COVID virus. People are going to have to go through and evaluate which vaccines work better than others, because obviously we only want the really good vaccines. And uh, experiments involve independent and dependent variables. We'll talk about those in just a second. Experiments can explore cause and effect by manipulating the variable of interest while keeping everything else the same. So only one thing is varying. So if your result changes, you know it has something to do with that variable that's been changed. Okay, I said they're independent and dependent variables. Independent variables are the variables that the experimenter manipulates, okay? The effect that's being studied. Dependent variables, they depend on the independent variables, right? So dependent variables change in response to the independent variables. So if we look at the example of the relationship between breastfeeding during childhood and uh, IQ later in life, if you were going to run an experiment to test those things, the way you would do it would be to find uh, people who were breastfed and people who were not breastfed. That would be your independent variable. And the thing that you're measuring is the dependent variable. That would be IQ. The dependent variable depends on the independent variable. There's also another term that you need to know for experimental studies, and that's the difference between an experimental group and a control group. In an experimental group, um, the, the, um, everybody who's in an experimental group gets the independent variable. So um, in the IQ and breastfeeding example, it would be the kids who got breastfeeding who would be in the experimental group. The control group is the people who did not get the independent variable. So for example, to keep going with the COVID vaccine, that seems to be on my mind lately, four people who um, actually get the COVID vaccine that's being tested, they'll be in the experimental group. There were some people that will either get a different vaccine or a sham vaccine, something called a placebo. That's a control group, and that gives you a baseline because everything is the same except what's being given. So when you don't, in the control group, when you don't give the subjects anything, it's what you actually give them is something called a placebo, and the placebo effect is fascinating. So the placebo effect is when you believe that you're going to get better because um, you're receiving some treatment. You believe you're receiving some treatment that will help you. And it turns out that people who get placebos feel better, improve more than people who don't get anything. It turns out that a placebo, sometimes you hear the term a sugar pill, just nothing. Placebos effectively treat depression, headaches, ulcers, 
uh, even heart problems in, in about half of patients. It's amazing. It's as if the knowledge or the belief that you're being treated is enough for your body to say, oh, well, I guess I better kick up some uh, immune system reaction because I'm being taken care of. You may have experienced the placebo effect yourself. If you're a parent or if you remember back to being a little, little kid, kids fall down all the time and they scrape their knees and then they cry. And then what do you do? You say, oh, come here, baby, come here. Let me kiss your, your boo-boo, your scraped knee, and that'll make it better, right? If you tell the kid, if you kiss the knee or maybe rub the knee and tell the kid, this will make the pain go away, it will. That's the placebo effect. And it turns out it's very, very difficult for pharmaceutical companies to develop uh, new medications that work better than the placebo. So here's a thought experiment. Uh, you've got a deadly um, virus, let's say COVID. Um, the experimental group gets the real treatment. Um, what should you give the control group? Nothing? or a placebo, an inactive, an inert drug that doesn't do anything. What's the best study? It's to give them the placebo, right? Because then both the experimental group and the placebo group believe to the same extent that they are being taken care of. Um, any experimental method in psychology that's, that's uh, or biology or biochemistry or psychopharmacology that's um, looking for effective techniques, effective new treatments, they have to have a placebo condition, a control condition. That is a proper base. Okay, that's it for this section. Um, what you want to do now is take the lab. Okay, guys.